which for some reason he said they called themselves the Rag, the Bag Lunch Infantry. Or something. I don't know what that was. They were captured at the Bulge, and he was a prisoner of the war. You know. It was a good book, right? The Kurt Vonnegut book. Was He's read it. He bought it. Right? So, you know, I've got him in the back of my car. Is that rain? Yeah, it's awesome. Awesome. They said it was supposed to rain today. It's uh -huh. awesome. We're just, the timing couldn't have been better. It was a dark and rainy night. <laughs> How can I use, we're supposed to use these things. I also want to acknowledge my colleague, Secret Street, who came today, a friend, and is from, you're near from, from around Dresden, correct? Yes. Uh, where Vonnegut was. And actually, you were an advisor on my book, The Prisoner of War Camps, helping me know what the German prisoners, where the damn umlauts go. So she looked at all my, I probably still didn't get them right, but she took a look at all those names. So uh, anyway, it's great to be here, and I do love this museum, and I try to promote it at every opportunity. Uh, I, about four years ago, I got a message from, a call from the History Press, which you all know about. Uh, if, you, if you ever go to a Barnes & Noble, if there are any of them left, they do these wonderful local histories. Is this work here? Oh. <coughs> they do local histories, and uh, I got a call and they said, hey, would you, we got a book on Pittsburgh in World War II, we got a book on Baltimore in World War II, would you like to do a book on Detroit? And, and I said, before he finished the sentence, I said, I'll take it, because it's such a great story, you know, the arsenal of democracy. So I wrote this book, I researched it, I enjoyed doing it. It's about Rosie the Riveter and Willow Run and the Warren Tank Arsenal and the movie theaters and Hank Greenberg and the streetcars. It's about life in Detroit and I really enjoyed doing it. And I do have to make another disclaimer, I've already said it. I'm not from here, I am a Hoosier from Indianapolis. In fact, I was telling someone yesterday, yes, I'm going over to a museum, it's on Gratiot Avenue. <laughs> and then I go home, I go back there periodically, and I try to explain to people in Indianapolis, it's a very flat place. I say, you know, people up in Detroit, they all drive south to go to Canada. This is, the, my Hoosier mind can't quite understand. <laughs> anyway, and I, was anybody here to hear me talk about this before? Because I've come here often. I got a call back from them, and they said, well, that went pretty well. We like that. Do you have any other ideas? And I did. Uh, I said, well, here's one. I discovered, to my surprise, when I was researching all aspects of life in World War II era Detroit, and Metro Detroit, I have to say, um, I discovered there were these Italian prisoners of war being held down by, down at Fort Wayne, as what, in Indiana, Fort Wayne's a city. <laughs> so I have to be clear about that. Uh, they were held at Fort Wayne and also at the fairgrounds. And I said, that's an interesting story. And when I looked into it just briefly, I saw, wow, Michigan actually had 6,000 prisoners of war during World War II. Beginning in 1943 all the way into the 1946, they were here. Mostly Germans scattered around the state in 32 camps, processed through Fort Custer near Battle Creek, but also a fair number of Italians, and I discovered it was part of a national system of uh, prisoners of war that we uh, housed in America during the Second World War. Turns out there were 425,000 POWs in the United States scattered around the country, and Michigan had 6,000 6, of them, and I said, wow, it's a great story, most people don't seem to know about it, and there's a lot of good, it's a good story, it's a lot of good human interactions to talk about, and so they said, they gave me the green light and I did it, and I enjoyed writing about Michigan's prisoner of war system. Raise your hand, I've already heard from a couple of people, how many of you knew that there were German and Italian prisoners of war in Michigan during World War II? Wow, this is ridiculous, all of you, most of you, a lot of you. And maybe some of you have stories. I think there's a story about, well, I, I heard all kinds of interesting stories about those Italians. Who, by the way, they were so happy, for the most part, to, you know, North Africa, take us America. Uh, shipped over, and they're getting me away from Mussolini, and the war, and the Germans. The Germans, for the most part, not all of them, but many of them were also happy. 
And it turns out it's a very good story, one that can people should know about, uh, not only the Michigan story, but nationally. We can be proud of it because we followed the Geneva Convention, uh, unlike most of the other countries in World War II. We treated these folks with humanity for the most part. Most of them behaved. They made a great effort, not perfect, to weed out the bad guys. You know, there were Nazis, and there were hardcore, there were some Waffen-SS, there were some fascists. They tried to get those guys out and send them to higher security camps like in Colorado and so forth. But most of the uh, Michigan POWs, Germans and Italians, were young, 20-year-old guys, teenagers, 17, 18, early 20s, who were homesick, slightly disoriented, and they were fairly, they were cooperative, and we treated them well. We followed the Geneva Convention. I don't think our ally, did, I, did the Soviet Union follow the Geneva Convention? <laughs> Remember that word? They were our ally for a minute. <laughs> But we, I mean, we do, we, we, we do have, a, in our museum, we do have a part of our corner display, we've got a POW. It lists all the different places yes. where we had camps, and, and treating them well, we even, they were even allowed, they worked on the, some of the local farms yes. and in the lumber mills, and they could actually earn money. They paid, I mean, it wasn't an exorbitant amount, but they could actually earn some money that they could spend at the camp they were right. at. Right, I talk about all that stuff as I discovered it. And I mean, the Germans could even get beer at the canteen, the PX and certain. They could drink three, two watered down beer. Is this a great country or what? Uh, these guys didn't know what hit them. It's a good story. There are wonderful examples of farmers and families getting to know these guys and treating them like friends and family sometimes. And many, I don't know the exact number, ended up coming back to the United States. They all had to be repatriated to war-torn rubble in Germany and Italy. But many of them came back to the United States. Maybe they married an American girl, or they had a sponsor, maybe a church group sponsored them. They came back to the U.S. and pursued and became American citizens. So it's a great story. People should know about this. These were the ideals that we were fighting for in the Second World War. And so we were able to do that. And the program was pretty much a rousing success, I would say. And uh, this room is different, but most people don't know about don't know about the German POW, or the, 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 Amer the Michigan POW system. Uh, I've got, uh, this is from 1943, May of 1943. Uh, the Escanaba Daily Press. I actually, by the way, one of the great things about writing this book was I get to travel every little corner of Michigan. And boy, did I learn lots of stuff. Give me a map test, I dare you. <laughs> I even know, I know where Escanaba is. I went my one and only trip to something called the Upper Peninsula. <laughs> and I went to Sidnaw. Y'all know Sidnaw, the metropolis of Sidnaw, where they were a German camp. There were about five camps up in the UP. They were cutting trees, working in pulp mills. Um, I was told and I discovered I was on a journey. I found a, the remains of a guard tower from the German camp at Camp Sidnow, which is, I don't know, you're in Marquette, you drive through trees for two hours, <laughs> and there's a little tiny crossroads in that Sidnow, Michigan. They were very nice to me, by the way. But I got to travel all over the state. Um, 1943, the war, the war is definitely turning in the Allies' favor. You all know that. Uh, this headline, you've got Churchill, Roosevelt. We're winning and we've defeated the Germans and the Italians in North Africa, which is great. And we're ready now to move on to Sicily and Italy and eventually Western Europe and indeed. We're winning the war. We had a problem though. Here's the problem. Suddenly we had thousands, tens of thousands of prisoners of war who'd been captured, most of them surrendered. I think they were maybe expecting around 70,000 prisoners in North Africa, in Tunisia, but it turned out there were like 225,000 troops, right, prisoners. And where are we going to put them? This is the problem. What are we going to do with these prisoners that we have? And Eisenhower on down said, we are going to follow the Geneva Convention. We're going to give them safety. We're going to get them out of the war zone. We're going to give them adequate shelter, food, etc." Uh, well, George C. Marshall, 
who is one of my heroes, who is not a household name but ought to be, the man who basically ran World War II for the United States, he came up, I think I give him credit for coming up with a beautiful example of Yankee ingenuity, let's kill two birds with one stone. They're holding these guys in open-air stockades out in the desert. It's not a very satisfactory arrangement. Basically, Marshall said, you know what, we, I have the solution here. He proposed this and it was accepted. We have these liberty ships, these ships taking over men and material across the Atlantic every week. And they're loaded down and then they come back almost empty. Why don't we ship these guys back to the United States on these ships? which have all this extra space. And that will get that, that'll be a place to store them. Uh, they're not likely to escape if they're sent up to the upper peninsula of Michigan, you know. He said also though, we have a terrible labor shortage in the United States. And as you mentioned, under the Geneva Convention, prisoners could volunteer for work and 95% of them did volunteer to work. So they could fill a gap, particularly in the agricultural sector. Uh, by 1944, I have a statistic, I think prisoners of war were one-third of the agricultural workforce in Michigan. You know, they were picking fruit in Berrien County, which I visited. They were working in the paper and uh, up in the trees in the UP. They were also a lot of sugar beets. Did you know sugar beets were in high demand during World War II because you couldn't get sugar? Can I quote the Walter Winchell poem about rationing real I just because sugar beets that's a big crop for us couldn't get Walter Winchell had a poem during wartime rationing he said roses are red violets are blue sugar is sweet remember <laughs> <laughs> so Michigan sugar beets but, you know a lot of crops would have rotted in the fields had not and and uh, I talked to a wonderful woman in her 80s Emily Foster over by Niles in Eau Claire and uh, she, she said, we had 10 Germans on our farm for three different summers. They were like big brothers to me. I was 12 years old. I was kind of in awe of these guys. And uh, we treated them well. And, uh, you know, she, she remembered them with such, uh, such joy. I got to have a really nice conversation with her. I forgot what my point was going to be. I was going somewhere with that. I'll, I'll get all round back to that. We got a problem, a labor shortage. So they were shipped across, and ultimately 425,000 or so are, arrive in the United States. Uh, and um, they are, first of all, the journey across the Atlantic was a, an arduous one for many of these guys. They're tankers, they're flyers, they're <laughs> ground soldiers. You know, first of all, it's a little difficult. And the Atlantic, as you well know, was infested with German U-boats in 1943, so they're zigzagging. They had been told, by the way, we had dropped leaflets behind lines saying, you will get fair treatment if you surrender, if you give yourself up, in North Africa and on into Italy and, and, and into Europe. But they'd been told, some of them been told, you're going to be tortured, you're going to be summarily executed, they're going to line you up and just shoot you. And they, quite, they didn't quite know what was going to happen to them as they made their way across the Atlantic. They arrived in uh, New York and in Boston and in Newport News and Virginia, the big uh, ports. And they get off these ships, you know. The first thing they noticed when they got to the East Coast, like in New York, they looked around and said, look at all these buildings. I thought that New York had been reduced to rubble. We were told that uh, our super weapons and we had, our Luftwaffe had destroyed New York or Boston, and that was not the case at all. It was everything. They couldn't believe the scale of things, the level of activity. I think by now a lot of them started to really think hard about, you know, we might not be winning this war, <laughs> even though we've been told otherwise. And so they're ready for the next stage of their journey. Of course, at every step of the way, they're being deloused and tagged and interviewed and given, you know, all kinds of uh, examinations and they're, you know, it's kind of a cattle call. They were allowed, by the way, to keep the, what was left of their uniforms, which they could then wear, they could wear it in camp. Uh, some of them did through the entire two or three years they were here. Uh, but off camp, off site, whether on a job site or a, 
whether whatever they're off the uh, out of the camp, they had to wear these blue or green fatigues with giant PW stenciled all over them. And uh, that makes it tough if you're thinking about escaping, wearing that outfit, and you don't speak English, and uh, you don't know quite where you are. Uh, I think Emily Foster put it very well when she talked to me about these Germans on her farm. She said, where are they going to go? They're, they're not escaping. And so we had minimum security for the most part, not the maximum security stuff. They, they got on the trains. Uh, they rode some of them in Pullman cars. I quote a man, uh, Mr. Conrad recalled, uh, we get on these trains, we're kind of emaciated, we're, we've been in the desert fighting. First thing that happened, there are bars on the windows, we don't quite know where they're taking. First thing that happened were these black porters get on the train and start going around serving us coffee and donuts. <laughs> uh, what, what is it? You know, they just cannot believe what's going on. And they take a long journey. One thing, and that many of them, by the way, initially the program in the U.S. was set up for the South and the Southwest, because you don't have to heat buildings in the wintertime down there. But Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Wisconsin, Illinois, we, we need, had a need, too. These were a resource. And we lobbied the War Department, and eventually Michigan got its fair share, too. But they are shipped across the country and uh, eventually assigned to camps scattered around. And I think one of the amazing things, these guys never understood, I don't think, the scale of the United States. You know, first of all, it takes you, how long does it take you to ride from New York to New Mexico? Uh, three, four days. This is a lot bigger than Italy. Um, many of them, uh, you know, thought, well, we're just being driven around. This is some sort of trick. This country can't be that big. And I have quotes from some of the Germans. Karl May wrote these westerns that apparently every German child read back in those days. As they got past New Jersey, they're looking for cowboys and Indians. <laughs> and where are they, you know? Um, so they're eventually sent around, and, and the first prisoners begin to arrive in Michigan. I have the date. My students always say, do I have to know dates? I happen to know this date. September 27, 1943. The first uh, POWs, Germans, about 250 of them, arrived in Benton Harbor, Michigan. Uh, they were from Camp Sheridan. They were brought by train. And uh, it's interesting to me, uh, people were told, and there's a wonderful sign. I took some pictures that are in the book right around the corner. This museum has some wonderful artifacts. I laugh every time I see it. No fraternization. <laughs> Civilians, keep your distance. These are enemy combatants. Do not trust them. Keep away from them. Well, that was violated all the time. As human beings are human beings. And that's kind of the good, fun story I wanted to tell. The entire town of Benton Harbor turned out to see these guys get off the train, you know? And they're throwing candy at them and stuff like that. And, um, they uh, stored them in the naval armory there. Sort of an experiment. How are they going to be? Michigan's a little bit slow to embrace this concept. And they picked fruit. They were there for the fruit harvest in the fall of 43 and went very well. They exceeded expectations in terms of their work and they caused almost no trouble. So then, the, another experiment will send a group over to Cairo, Michigan. I've been there. <laughs> Question, is Cairo in the thumb? No. When does the thumb begin? <laughs> That's the one I've never figured out. They think it is. Is it not the thumb? Yes. You said definitively no. It, it's, it is east of the tip side of the Okay. Where does the thumb start then? <laughs> Please tell me. It start, it's not Romeo. Uh, no. no it Romeo. starts at uh, like I-69. Okay. All right. And then most of it's east of um, like M53. Okay. Like, that makes sense. Uh, well, at any rate, Cairo had several hundred Germans equally successful in terms of what they did. And so by the winter of 1943, the green light is given. And at one time, there were 5,000 POWs at Fort Custer, uh, living in barracks. And then they were distributed. Ultimately, there were, people guess, 32 camps around the state. Some of them were teeny-weeny little sub-camps 
seasonal camps, tent camps that were there for three weeks for the harvest and then moved on and maybe they stayed at Custer or other places that had barracks um, later. They stored them in all kinds of places, fairgrounds, Owasso, Michigan, I've been there, Owasso. Uh, they have a racetrack, an auto racetrack, that's where they stored them five miles west of town. Um, they restored a lot of guys, there were some CCC camps, and do I need to say what that stands for? The Civilian Conservation Corps from the 30s. In Sidna, that's where they kept them, and they kind of refurbished them. Pretty minimal security. I've learned so much about Michigan. <laughs> Did you know that Fremont, Michigan, I didn't know this. Gerber's, it is the baby, baby food capital of the world. <laughs> Who knew? That's why it smells like prunes and squash. <laughs> by steam or whatever. So, you know, there were Germans there at Camp Fremont, not to be confused with Camp Freeland. Uh, I've been to almost, I haven't been to all the camps, there are 32 of them. I never could find Camp Pori, a little dot up in the middle of uh, the UP. I've been to probably, out of 32, maybe 27 or 28 of them. Um, there's not much evidence of them today, not much physical evidence. That's what's so great about your museum. You've got the stuff from Italians and it, some German stuff. Uh, the drawing of the girlfriend, uh, which is in the book, and they did a good job of reproducing that. Most, most of the camps, uh, they didn't leave much evidence. And, uh, you know, have to, you have to look around to find plaques or to find metal detector people go up and look for, you know, uh, barbed wire that was taken down, stuff like that. There's not much evidence, physical evidence of it left. And that's why I drove so far to go to Sidna, Michigan to find this guard tower. And this, I'll let you know, what I actually found it. I found it in two pieces. So they're brought here, and um, they are, you know, the camps are supposed to have double rings of barbed wire. I would say minimum security. Okay. What can I say about the guards? They were not mostly the crack soldiers, you know, not the elite commando types. This was a very low status position to be an administrator or to be a guard at the camp. And I don't want to generalize too much here, uh, but many of them were people who'd been deemed unfit for combat or, or were older people or maybe had a pot belly or something. The guards were, uh, you know, where are they going to go? Minimum security. They were there. They actually fraternized like crazy with the men that they guarded. You know, they they drank. The Italians made gra grappa, you know, and the uh, Germans made schnapps, and uh, they trade their coupons for beer. And uh, there was a healthy black market going on between the people who ran the camp and the guards, and, uh, and they gambled, you know, and stuff like that. All those things, the guards were very close to the prisoners for the most part. It was pretty low security. And I got a bunch of stories, you know. Uh, one time a guard, a kid, a guy remembers, I was 10 years old, living up in the UP, and a guard came up to me, I was kind of watching these Germans work, and he handed me his rifle. I said, watch these guys for a couple hours. I'm going to go visit my girlfriend in town. <laughs> it's true. I mean, it, 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 um, I think my favorite story about the guards, and I don't want to generalize, you know, uh, but uh, um, Gerd Lindemann is a person that I quote. He ended up living over by Holland eventually. He was a high-level officer in the Africa Corps. He reported directly to Rommel. And uh, he ended up he ended up at a place called Camp Allegan. You know where Allegan County is over there on the south of Grand Rapids? And there's a little lake there called Lake Allegan. Gerd Lindemann was there and they're picking fruit every day. And he and uh, so this is an elite. He, he says things like, well, first of all, we realize maybe these aren't the crack soldiers. When the Americans talk to their officers, their hands are sometimes in their pockets. You know, it's a little bit lax. Um, you know, so, but he told a story where one day our guard liked to take his regular 2.30 afternoon nap while we're working in the trees. And he said, by the way, we protected him. 
you know, we weren't going to go anywhere, and if we heard that the commandant's jeep was arriving or a surprise, we, we got him, you know, made him, we protected the guy. But one day, we decided, Gerd Linden was telling this story, he was remembering this, we decided to play a little joke on our guard, who we liked a lot. He was taking his nap, and uh, they, a couple of them slipped up by him and took his rifle, slipped his rifle away from him and they disassembled it and hid it. <laughs> then they stood there and threw little pebbles at the guard's helmet. Ping, ping. Oh my God, where's my rifle? I'm in big, big trouble. Oh my God. And they said, we know where it is. So they extorted him. They uh, you know, bribed, blackmailed him. We'll give it back to you. We're going to get extra cigarettes, lucky strikes. We're going to get some candy bar. We're going to get Cokes. You know, they, they extorted everything they could out of him. And Lindemann said, so we gave him back the pieces, but he couldn't put the rifle back together. <laughs> so we did it for him. <laughs> and he gave the quote that I use for a chapter in the book, Hogan's Heroes in Reverse. <laughs> so if you want to think about Sergeant Schultz, I don't want to generalize too much, and I like Sergeant Schultz, by the way. But again, where's the, where, where are they really going to go? There were a few escape attempts nationally. Some people tried to dig tunnels. You know, you're, you're under, I think as a soldier, you're supposed to try to escape, right? Um, but most in Michigan, people who walked off jobs were quickly recaptured within hours. Uh, and there was not much. Again, they didn't really know the scale of this country. There's another great story from Camp Allegan. There's a lake over there, and two Germans one day walked off their job site. They were picking apricots and apples. And uh, they jumped into this lake. They get out there, dripping wet after a while. They're exhausted. They're immediately picked up by the Michigan State Police. And uh, one of the policemen, one of the troopers said, well, what were you guys thinking? And he said, well, I thought we just swam across Lake Michigan. <laughs> we're trying to get to Chicago when we heard there were Germans who might assist us. So uh, they really, can I walk to New Orleans? I'd like to walk to Germany. How, how far is South America? You know, they, they really didn't get a sense of the scale of this place. There was one escape attempt that got international attention. You all like scandals. The Owasso scandal. They're still talking about this today. And I looked at a story. Two girls helped two Germans escape. Two, two teen, they, well, one was 19, Shirley Druce and Kitty Case, 19 and 20 year old. Girls from Bennington in Shiawassee County. They had a big adventure. They worked side by side with Germans at a cannery. A lot of, you know, there were a lot of the guys worked for Welch's or some of the big processors or Gerber or uh, you know, canneries of various kinds. They worked side by side with the, and, and a little romance is developed, right? Fraternization. So somebody decided it would be a good idea for them to borrow one of their mother's car, pull around the back of the cannery in downtown Owasso. The two, uh, their boyfriends, Africa Corps guys, this is a piece of cake for them. They come out of the bushes, get in the car, and they ride around most of the night. And they're captured the next morning. And I actually took this story. It's in this current issue of... Uh, it's so, people love scandal. It's in the Michigan History Magazine. It's true. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's got love. It's got treason. It's got everything you want. It's a dramatic story. Well, the girls, when they were arrested, they're kind of giggling. Everybody's laughing. Kind of fun thing. Okay, you caught us. The, German, the two Germans were sent off to a higher security place, I think, in Colorado. But the two girls, okay, can we go now? <laughs> no, this is wartime. They called in FBI agents from Detroit to grill them. What were you doing? What was your plan? Do you sympathize with the Nazi cause? You know, all these questions. And for several days, they kept them in jail for a couple of days and thought about throwing the book at them and charging them with treason which, as you know, has a death penalty. <laughs> it made national news, international news. Uh, Owasso, Michigan, two girl, two young women in Michigan to help Germans escape. They ended up, they let them go, they rearrested them, and they ended up charging them with conspiracy, which is still a pretty serious crime. 
a big trial in January of 45 in Bay City Federal Court and everybody was covering this thing and uh, it, eventually they were sent to charge they were convicted of conspiracy and uh, they one served a year the other served a year and three months minus time served and uh, in federal prison and you know small town their lives were ruined basically we were discussing this before and they as soon as they got out they moved as far away as from Shiawassee County as they could get um, but this made uh, international and, and I have a great letter from a marine out in the Pacific some people worried that they were we were coddling these guys in fact my new favorite word I've read many letters to the editor in many small town newspapers from this time. We're molly coddling <laughs> these guys. And there was actually a quote from some congressman who wanted headlines. He said, I've seen where they live, I, I've seen their facilities, their it's like the Waldorf Astoria. What are we doing here? So, and I understand why people would worry that these guys are being treated better than, you know, my, my, my brother is over there uh, in Okinawa living outside in a, you know, under fire. Why are these guys being treated so well? These were exaggerated, and I would say, if I had to use a word to describe the conditions, they were Spartan. Uh, many of the guys, when they, saw, when they arrived at Fort Custer and saw picnic tables lined up with plates and utensils and all the food you could eat, they started crying. You know, they couldn't believe, and they put back on some weight that they had lost. Um, but, you know, there was a sense, there's, I have a letter from a Marine uh, from, he was in the Pacific, he was outraged about what happened in Owasso, Michigan, and he said, every one of the guys, work, uh, the men who were working at that camp and guarding these guys should be immediately sent to frontline duty, and they can learn something about military discipline, you know, so. Uh, there was a worry that they were being coddled, but I would say they were not. They were being treated decently, and for the most part, it worked out well. There are all kinds of great stories. There's another one from Owasso, the same cannery. Uh, a woman's house caught on fire. She was just back from having her 10th child or something like that. And the Germans are standing at the cannery, and they just, without even asking the guards, climbed the fence, ran over, and saved this woman and her child, and it was in the newspaper. And so there are really good stories like that. I'm glad the guards didn't start shooting, you know. They understood what they were doing. Um... Let's see, they, uh, they had recreational facilities. Uh, a, couple, a couple more stories. I'll, I'm going to show you a slideshow here in a minute. But, uh, camps, depending on, Custer had great uh, recreational facilities. You know, pool tables, ping pong, uh, lots of gambling and cards being played, chess, checkers. Uh, a camp up, Camp Sidney had, a, in the winter, they had an Olympics. You know, with track and field events, and they gave little homemade medals to each other. And uh, by the way, when those Germans were delivered to Sydna, they've been in Africa, and they, they get off the train. In, they, they arrive in in, Jan, in February in Sydna in the UP, and they get off the train, and a lot of say, "Hey, I like this. This is more like Germany, <laughs> better than the desert," you know. And they, they didn't really seem to bother them. Uh, all kinds of recreational opportunities. If you were a good citizen, you could even take extension courses. You could take classes. They were allowed to have holiday celebrations. Uh, they were allowed you know, church services, sometimes local ministers. You know what I think helped to make things work so well? And this has to be said. There are so many people of German descent in Michigan. And many of them spoke the language, and so that helped, right? And also Italians. There are many Italians in the copper country and the iron country of the UP. And, of course, parishes uh, on the east side of Detroit adopted... By the way, the Italian status changed. One day, Chris, we can talk and you can explain to me Italy's role in World War II. I never quite figured out what they were... They re they, there was an armistice where they surrendered in September of '43. So the POW is at, at Fort Wayne, and suddenly their status changed, and you have the emblems out there. They were no longer prisoners of war, they were, and they could volunteer for Italian service units. And people were encouraged, bring them, they can go to church, uh, bring them to the house for grandma's cannoli, you know. I mean, there was a lot of interaction going on, a lot of romances born. 
the Italians played on the stereotype of the happy-go-lucky. They would tell the girls who came to flirt around. I, I talked to a lady, yeah, I was 14 years old. We used to go down to the fence at Fort Wayne and flirt with these cute Italian guys. And the Italians say things like, we're lovers, we're not fighters, you know. Um, you know, and that sort of thing happened. Um, and again, stereotypes. I hate to generalize, but there were certain patterns that people would comment on, and I just quote them. One administrator said, uh, I think this was at Custer, he said, we, you know, with, even without their uniforms, you can tell who the Italians are and who the Germans are. If there's a work detail, the Germans will show up with their shovels all in perfect alignment, you know, and ready to go. The Italians, the shovels are pointed every which way, they're gabbing and chattering and seeming to have a good time. I like both groups, but, uh, you know, there were certain patterns that some of the guards noticed. And the, they had a, the, the mess, the uh, kitchen was extremely popular among guards, the Italian mess at Fort Wayne. A lot of the guards and administrators ate there. And what those guys could do with limited meat and limited sugar and so forth was quite amazing. So, you know the D'Eduardo uh, restaurant? Uh, he was a prisoner of war at uh, Fort Wayne learned to cook there, was repatriated back to Modena in Italy, came back with his wife and in the 50s started this restaurant. There's one in Gross Point and now there are one downtown in Spain. So a lot of these guys came back and they became very successful Americans. Let me say a couple, something about, let me say something about the uh, sports. They, anything, these are young guys with a lot of energy. The thing they most loved, of course, was football. Uh, il calcio, in Italian. And man, they just obsessed about it. They talked about it. They had teams. Camps played against each other. And oftentimes, townspeople would come around on a Sunday to watch. Every, every camp had a little soccer pitch, even if it's just a piece of ground of dirt. And they'd watch very high-level football being. Um, and so they, they, they kind of kept them going. Uh, I have a quote from a German, he said, I work so hard picking apples so I don't have to think about my infant child that I've never met, or my family back home. You had to have something on your mind, and we, they, the recreation was a big part of it. Well, here's the story I want to tell you, UP. Who's been to Germfask, Michigan? I have. Germfask? How do you spell that? G-E-R-M-F-A-S-K. Uh, I had discovered, I, I went through there, it's in the eastern UP, and uh, I went through there, you know, what I wanted to see, there was a camp, a German camp close to there, uh, near O-Train is the name of the camp, and they played soccer matches, and sometimes camps would play each other. Well, I discovered there was a CO camp by Germfask, which is a good place to send people if you want them to be isolated the Siberia of, uh, you know, the camp system. There were, there were conscientious objectors, not a lot of them during World War II, but somehow, you know, they had convinced their draft boards that due to religion or conscience they wouldn't fight, and they were assigned to alternate, alternate, alternative service. So there was a camp with about 85 COs, and they did work in the National Park right up there, and planted trees, and, you know, similar to the camp system for the prisoners. Um, and they had a soccer team, and I discovered once that the Germans from O-Train played a soccer game against the conscientious objectors, the Americans. Mm. These were administered, by the way, by the Quakers and the Mennonites, and it was pretty, the peace churches, it was pretty loosely run. Well, let me tell you, so I, I, I'm coming back, my one and only trip to the UP. I stop off in Germfask, it's about quarter till noon. And I stop at the store there and I say, uh, does anybody remember the German camp that was around there? Oh, you need to talk to Omar, the town manager. He's, but he knocks off about 12, so you better go down to the city office or the post office. And I found Omar, who's in his mid-80s, and he talked my ear off the entire <laughs> afternoon. We learned everything. But he said, oh, I remember those Germans. Yeah, you know, they worked hard and they were good and, you know, it was no problem. And I, then I asked him, do you remember the conscientious objector camp? He, oh, I hated those <laughs> SOBs. You know, we all hated them. 
uh, and the idea was, you know, at least these Germans were fighting for their country, but these guys were, you know, cowardly. We didn't like. They're probably communists and troublemakers, and they were troublemakers to some degree. So I found out that bad feeling still exists even today, 80 years later. We didn't like them guys, you know. And he says, I remember the day I was called out of grade school to be told that my older brother had been killed in the Pacific. So I'm looking at these C, conscientious objectors. I don't like them too much. And by the way, they tried to explain to the Germans this concept of alternative service. You know, uh, I don't think, I, I'm not going to serve due to conscience. I have a quote from, there was a Hungarian among them. There were certain other people. There was even a couple of Russians up in the UP. The Hungarian said, uh, alternative service, don't they just shoot them? <laughs> you know, what a great country, you know. But the punchline of this story is they had a big showdown between the O-train Germans and the CO American. They, they had shirts that said bombers, the CO bombers, and they had a soccer match. Good game. Tied at one to one at the end. Here's what's amazing. The American, the folks from around Germfast showed up and they were cheering for the Germans. <laughs> That's crazy. In the middle of World War II. So, I, what I try to do is find interesting stories. Oh, by the way, I had Germfast. I did ask Omar, where does this name, why would you name a town Germfast? Oh, that's the first eight letters of the founders of the town. G-E-R-M-F-A-S-K. So, see, I know baby food capital in the world. I know all kinds of information. Um, maybe I'll go to the slides. I, there are interesting moments. A lot of these guys, some of them were woodworkers and artists and mechanics, and they worked on trucks and vehicles. There's an opera singer that I talk about and a concert pianist among the Germans who Emily Foster knew. And they would get up and do little performances. They had little camp orchestras sometimes. They had play, you know. Uh, Hogan's Heroes in Reverse. I don't know about that. Let me just close before I, then I'll just run through the uh, slides. There is a great moment. Uh, do you know where Sparta, Michigan is? Yes. That was a good POW camp, wasn't it? Well, yeah, that was an especially good one, I suppose. Why do you say that? How do you know about that? Yeah. Agriculture. We Absolutely. And that was kind of the pattern around the state. And as you mentioned, they made like 80 cents a day, which they didn't say, you know, at the end of the week, here's your 350 or whatever, because that might escape. They handed it to them in coupons or script, which they could use in a little canteen. The Germans could, did I mention the Germans could buy three, two beer? <laughs> uh, there was a camp in Sparta, which is fruit country. A, a tent camp at the edge of town. And uh, they called the guy, the Germans who worked there, it was Peach Ridge Road, so they called them the Peach Ridge POWs. They were very well behaved. They were much liked by the townspeople. They were trucked out to work each day in the fields and in the orchards and came back and harvested apples and Michigan fruit. And uh, in fact, there's a big uh, orchard called Craft Orchards. And this is in Kent County, north of Grand Rapids. And uh, the son of the owner of the Kraft Orchards worked side by side with the Germans, including this one guy, Roland Detschel. And he said, we would talk and we'd talk politics. And he was the leader of the Germans because he could speak English. He was our go-between. And uh, the, this Kraft guy, Merlin Kraft, said, I remember we were working out in the orchards and, and De Roland would tell me, you know, one day when Germany wins this war, you know, I'll come back and I'll ask for your farm and you can work for me. <laughs> and Merlin said, I never knew if he was kidding or serious. So. But there's a poignant moment um, that I'd like to talk, maybe I'll just do a brief reading uh, from the book that maybe captures this kind of respect, this kind of humanity that develops when people are to. This is the story I really wanted to tell about how once you weed out the bad guys and you put these folks together, a typical scenario would be, uh, Emily Foster told me, the first day the Germans arrived, my dad brought them out, they were outside the house and they're sitting on crates eating their lunch, and keep away from these guys, no fraternization. Day two, 
She said, my mother noticed their lunches were terrible, these stale bread with a little piece of sausage or something. So her mother whipped up a little extra, made them spaghetti and chili and maybe a piece of pie. <laughs> By day three or four, they're sitting up on the porch. Some of them are coming into the house. They're playing with the children. And this didn't happen all the time, but it did happen quite a bit where people almost kind of became family. And so if I could just read a very short about the Sparta, the Peach Ridge POWs. Uh, this is a story that I discovered. Uh, most poignant about the stories of the Peach Ridge POWs, this is outside of Sparta, Michigan, is one involving the Lamoro family whose house stood directly opposite this tent camp of Germans. People in Sparta agonized as the three blue stars in its front window, through which Alice Lamoureux could see the prisoners getting on and off the trucks that took them to work, turned gold, one after the other, marking the combat deaths of her sons, Al, Donald, and Howard, all in their early 20s. It was something we didn't want to talk about, but we couldn't help thinking about, a neighbor recalled. A few of us were worried about what a German war camp, practically in her own backyard, would do to her. Uh, the apprehensions proved unfounded. My mother was a very strong person, Mrs. Lamoureux's daughter explained years later, and she took the camp's presence in stride. In fact, she sent over cookies, little treats to them, Despite her unimaginable grief, at no time did she display even a trace of bitterness or animosity toward the enemy soldiers she watched every day through her window. And the prisoners responded in kind. As they were being dropped off at the gate one afternoon, having heard that yet another regret to inform telegram had been received at the residence, a detail of men marched across the street in solemn orderly ranks Stopping at attention just below the porch, there they offered a long, silent salute, executed an about-face, and returned wordlessly to their compound. We've got mothers, too, who lost boys, two, three, maybe, Roland Detchel told Merlin Kraft when he was asked about why they did it. We respect everybody who, how you say, makes sacrifice. So there's a bunch of interesting stories like that. And uh, uh, yeah, that's a nice little story. I can barely read that one. Yeah. So uh, let's, um, I'll run you through my slides. And uh, so I just push this little button. Okay. Yeah, this is going to work. This, I feel like a weatherman. Partly cloudy. <laughs> it's not raining, by the way. So here's, you know, the war is turning in North Africa, and we got the problem. Here's our problem. We've got these prisoners. What are we going to do that with them in the desert of North Africa? Uh, these are Germans, I believe. And uh, they're just kind of out of the open air. They need some sort of permanent facilities. They shipped them back on Liberty ships and other ships that were not built for comfort. And you can see it's rather crowded conditions. They were sleeping on bunks underneath. And it was, most of the guys remembered that as a very arduous uh, journey, zigzagging through U-boat waters in the Atlantic. They arrive. This is a photograph uh, in Boston. You can see these are Germans. They still have the, their Africa Corps peaked caps, and they're boarding a train, a Pullman train. Um, for a destination, they still don't quite know where they're going. And you can see the guard, part of the guard, up there watching them. There are guys with rifles watching them carefully. But uh, they are sent around the country. Can you see? Um, this is a rough map. In 44, you, you can see that the prisoner war camps, mostly Germans, but 51,000 Italians and a few others, are scattered all over the country, a lot of them in the south. But eventually, Michigan and the Great Lakes states got their share. Oh, and uh, here's a, this is from around the other, just walk around the corner, this is a list of Michigan camps that uh, this wonderful museum has, and you can see where they are. This is an ad from the Shiawassee County Argus Press. And it says everything that needs to be said. If you are a farmer, and Emily Foster said those guys were a deliverance when they arrived as extra labor when we were working on the farm. Individual farmers could get help. 
they had to go apply to the county extension agency agent and if they had urgent need you know they had to take a minimum of 10 sold 10 prisoners and they had to pick them up and drop them off and you know treat them well and so for maximum hours safe conditions this is a photograph I took this is just the naval armory in Benton Harbor where the first bunch of Germans arrived in September of 43 this is a tent camp. I think this is this is maybe a uh, freeland camp. Typical tent camp. You can see it's very temporary. Very little, there's no evidence left of it other than perhaps this photo, photographs like this and maybe a few people's memories. Uh, it was just there for the harvest. Uh, this is a plaque. I found the plaque, but I couldn't find any evidence of the camp. Way up in the UP, a former CCC camp. And you can see that they do acknowledge that it was used as a German prisoner of war camp. This is the this is right around the corner. If you want to have a chuckle, go take a look at this. Type of sign you can see. No fraternization with prisoners of war in any way. And this was routinely violated. The, this is a photograph uh, from Owasso. This is actually that auto racetrack. Camp. These are guys at the end of the week, I guess, getting their uh, coupons you know, for the PX after for their working 80, 80 cents a day. They worked hard. This is in this building as well. This is an actual camp canteen ship from Fort Custer. And here are Germans drinking 3 2 beer at the Custer PX. It's quite amazing. So they were supposed to be limited to one per night, but I think they traded the ones and got around them. Here's the mess uh, and the Germans at uh, Fort Custer. It doesn't look like the Waldorf story to me, but they were pretty amazed at the quantity and quality of the fresh food. They, were they like spam. They like spam. <laughs> <laughs> Even and the Italians did amazing things with spam. This is Camp Custer, Germans. Uh, I think all soldiers play cards and gamble and stuff like that. And every night, killing time. Ping pong table at Custer. Uh, now, I have to say, you know, they were trained to do these salutes and they were following their military training. So, I don't know how deeply they believed in Nazism, but they, they did the salutes, and they saluted their officers. Some of them celebrated secretly Hitler's birthday on April 20th. You know, they, some of them thought right to the end that Germany's still going to win the war. The Fuhrer is going to come up with secret weapons and we still win the war. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's a picture from Fort Custer. This is the this is the camp outside of Sparta, which you can see is a tent camp. Pretty pretty basic, pretty Spartan there in Sparta. These are the Peach Ridge POWs I just talked about. Uh, they worked hard for the orchards, and they were in pretty good spirits. And the morale was high. There were no escape attempts. And this is Roland Detschel, who I mentioned uh, was part of that group that I gave the salute at the in front of the Monroe family's porch. He's the guy who said, one day I'll come back and you can work for me. Uh, it, this is in this building. These are the Italian service unit patches. And those guys, the ISU guys, I believe, you can correct me, I think they had a little bit more freedom than prisoners of war. Sometimes they even got like a weekend pass. They could wander around Detroit and uh, go out on dates sometimes. Some of this didn't go over well. And the guys in the field overseas, they were hearing bad stories, you know, about girls dating prisoners, and they weren't happy about it. This is a picture from Fort Wayne, Italian service units. They look pretty spit and polished there. There were uh, haberdashers, there were tailors, there were mechanics, there were artists. This is Fort Custom, Fort, Fort Wayne, Italians. Uh, I guess he's putting the patch on. This is, these are butchers at Fort Wayne. Italians know their way around the kitchen, some of them. Uh, again, Fort Wayne, sometimes there were pool tables. Now, who in this room are my people of Italian descent? I love it. 
I have to apologize. The next picture is slightly stereotyped. They posed for it. Uh, Italians at Fort Wayne having a good time. <laughs> and I think they tried to cram in everything. They could. That's the barber shop, obviously. They're posing for the picture. But I think, you know, the idea that a lot of Italians said, you saved, you saved our lives, you know. We're, we're actually might survive this war now, and they really liked America for the most part. The, they wrote mail back home, by the way. And I have a quote. Uh, one guy wrote, it had to be heavily censored in the Red Cross, and sometimes it didn't get through, but there was a piece of mail back to Italy, and the guy said, I wish that, we're f I'm fine, and... How are you? And we don't, we're being well fed. And I wish Sicily could become the 49th state. <laughs> you know? um, this is right around the corner. I, I don't believe this even still exists. Uh, a, a camp uh, artist took apparently a girlfriend's photograph and a picture. All kinds of skills and talents, hobbies. So as you leave here, after purchasing a dozen books, you should go around the corner. <laughs> go around the corner. There's a wonderful. Have you seen that exhibit for the? Uh, for the POWs? This is the soccer pitch outside of Camp Owasso. Very Spartan, as you can see. High quality. These are the ten Germans at the uh, Emily Foster's farm, and you can see that's her younger sister sitting there with them. Pretty. They're you know they're pretty being treated almost like family. After the war, a lot of these guys wrote to their families that they worked for and said things like, thank you for your good treatment, and please, could you send some shoes and some, you know, basic, even spam? <laughs> we, we, there were a lot of stuff sent over to these guys, and they visited years later. This is me with Emily Foster, who I think she's like 87 years old, and she's ready to fight World War II again. She's very, uh, very vibrant and lively. Uh, here's the scandal in Owasso. This is the Argus Press, Shiawassee County. Quartet captured in woods after all night search. This was serious business. They had a manhunt man out for these two, for these four. They were found guilty and for aiding Nazi prisoners. Shirley Case, Kitty Case, and Shirley Drew are their names. There they are. Uh, this young. Uh, just out of one, still a teenager, and I think they thought it was a lark, but it was wartime, and they learned that the hard way. Um, girls go to prison, and as as soon as they got out of federal prison, as soon as they could, each of them moved away from from Shiawassee County. This is the story I mentioned in Owasso, also a good story where mother and babe carried out. Um, the German prisoner of war can be a gentleman wants to, so states Mr. Frank Worthington of 532 Garfield Avenue. They saved his wife and baby. This is a wonderful uh, drawing that a camp artist made over, in the, over they're working on Emily Foster, the Teichman farm. Uh, what happened was, there were accidents on the job and mishaps. I'm told that processing, wood, working in a, cutting down trees is a very hazardous job. Um, and there were a little a couple of guys, one guy got electrocuted, and you know, there were a few deaths here and there, but mostly minor stuff. This was a day, they were coming back from the day, and they were being taken on the truck back to their camp, and they heard this thump on the front bumper. And uh, they all got out, and you could see the farmer, and also a couple of the field are all looking down. It's a dead chicken in the middle of the road. And, you can correct me on the German, but I'm told this roughly translates. At the end of the day, they got back and the guy drew a drawing of it for their little camp newspaper, probably. I'm told this says, another way of hunting. Kind of a joke, you know? There was a terrible accident, one of the worst in the entire country, in Blissfield, outside of Blissfield, where people, Germans were uh, working on picking sugar beets. A truck uh, crossed the train tracks, uh, this is in southeastern Michigan, um, down by Adrian. And uh, the, 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 things were, the view was obscured by trees, apparently an investigation was done. A New York Central westbound slammed into the truck, threw some guys 300 feet. 16 were killed, most of them immediately. And the guard, uh, who was from Cadillac, Michigan, uh, 
17 total were killed. And you can see that this made international news, a terrible tragedy. And what's interesting is the whole town turned out for, to kind of memorialize these guys. They'd known some of them. Uh, they, this is Camp Custer. They had full military ceremonies for the 16 who died at Bliss Field. These are the guys having their... Uh, the, uh, German flags were specially flown in for the ceremony, for the funeral, from Philadelphia, from the quartermaster. They're burying them there at Fort Custer. And who's been, by the way, to Fort Custer's cemetery, National Cemetery? You must go there someday. It's a beautiful place. Just turn off of 94 the next time you're going to Kalamazoo. And uh, you will see that uh, buried there, there's a section, section B, if you look for it, there's a section that has 26 headstones in a row. Germans who, were, who died in captivity in Michigan during World War II, and 16 of them are these guys killed at Blissfield. Um, beginning in the 1950s, Veterans groups from the United States and Germany and through the German consul in Detroit started having ceremonies every year to kind of remember these guys. Volks Trauer Tag. What's Volks Trauer Tag? That's Memorial Day, Veterans Day kind of a ceremony. Yeah, it's like the day of remembrance yeah. of the people. Yeah. And they do it every year. I think they just had it a couple weeks ago. It's quite a nice uh, kind of healing thing between former enemies. Here's the program for the 1982 Volks Trauer Tag ceremony. And here's a picture I took of the uh, grave. That's at Fort Custer National Cemetery. 26 headstones. One guy, I think he must have been 20, named Rolf Arnold, died. They all died on Halloween. It was a terrible accident. They had a little Halloween party planned back at the camp. They had made masks and they had special food and they had to cancel all of that. This is Rolf Arnold, and he looks like a pretty young guy. This, my friends, is downtown train station, Sidna, Michigan. It's a picture I took two years ago. Imagine it in February. Um, so it's a tiny little dot up there, but I did find what I was looking for, the guard tower which I'm told now they're, they've raised some money, they're trying to preserve it. It's in pretty bad shape. It's in two pieces. I took a bunch of pictures. There's the guard tower from Camp Sidnaw. And it definitely needs a little rehab. <laughs> and here's Germfast, where they still hate those conscientious objectors decades <laughs> later. So they're very patriotic there. Um, I, I want to open it up. People in here have had experiences or... Uh, you wanted to tell a story about the, the Italians, didn't you? Oh, it's, um, my grandmother would tell a story. She lived on uh, Cooper, off of Russia, on the east side, in kind of more of an Italian uh, neighborhood. And she was kind of too young, but she remembers some of the um, teenage girls and stuff kind of older. They would take the streetcars to the state fairgrounds and try to pick up some Italian men. <laughs> <laughs> And there were actually marriages, you know, that happened later. The guys all had to go back. They had to be repatriated, but they, one way or another, they could find their way back. Yes, sir. I, uh, one of my uncles worked at the tank arsenal and warned yeah. in the war. Yeah. And coming out at the end of his shift, uh, there were behind a fence, there were Italian uh, prisoners. Do you know anything about why they were there or, or what they might have done? Well, they were. They did municipal work like road repair, uh, parks, playgrounds. And was it because the arsenal had guards and so on that it was convenient? I suppose, yeah. And by the way, the Geneva Convention allows work in non-related, war-related okay. jobs. So I'm a little bit surprised they let them get within shouting yeah, no, distance of were, the tank arsenal. They were behind. Yeah. And maybe they were Italian service units guys by that time. I don't know. And my uncle said they they would do the Italian the finger game for cigarettes and trade <laughs> cigarettes over the fence. Yeah, yeah. That's great. I love these stories and I pick up some. Were they all male? Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm sure there were prisoners in Europe or taken a female few. But uh, they were all men. And most of them were in their late teens, early 20s. 
officers, uh, they, they kind of uh, manage the discipline, of, they left it to themselves to do, and they, they, they stored separately. I do have to point out, people ask me about uh, Japanese. Um, first of all, there weren't very many Japanese POWs taken in the Pacific, and it was a long way, very few were brought to the continental US. There were a couple of high security camps, one in Wisconsin, where actual Japanese prisoners were held and interrogated and so forth. But also, you got to keep in mind, uh, you know, we were interning Japanese Americans at this time. And if you look at newspapers and Newsweek from the day, and also, we had a segregated army. And there were people like in the black community or Japanese Americans saying, these enemy guys are being treated better than us, as American citizens. So, um, you know, it was like sort of, we weren't perfect, uh, and this was a sort of an injustice that was pointed out by some people. Yes? Yeah, did you ever uh, go up to Croswell, Lexington, or the camp there? I did. I went to Croswell, and... Um, did you find it? Uh, well, I know they were, they were kept, I have a little reference to that in there. Uh, I, it's hard to find. They were they were kept in a building downtown, I think. Were they working sugar beets up there? What's the sugar company? Sugar beets are part of uh, orchards here. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, yeah. Croswell. And, um... I guess I should probably just look. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> that, yeah, why should, well, I'm not going to read it to you for free. <laughs> I'm already working cheap here. I got a lifetime membership. Um... I just want to read this one. You brought up Croswell, just to show that I remember where it is. Um, and I think I may use it to make a point. Okay. It made a difference that right, think about this, it made a difference that right below the Croswell Sanilac Jeffersonian, which is the newspaper, right below the headline Prisoner of War Camp established at airport was a notice announcing Schutzler's observed observe 45th anniversary. <laughs> so there's a lot of Germans around and they were ready to embrace them. Other stories, questions, comments? Yes? I was, uh, I gave a talk uh, years ago at Fort Wayne, about yeah. the history of Fort Wayne, and I had a couple of ladies come up. Uh, one worked, uh, both of them worked in the fort. One was Italian descent, her father was from the old country. And when they allowed them to, when they were in the service units, they were allowed to, to go and visit and, and have dinners at, at local yeah. families. And her father wouldn't have them. He said he, they were yeah. enemy and he would not have one of them in his home. And she was trying to explain that you know everybody was doing it, it was okay, they're not the enemy anymore. No, he wouldn't have them. I can and see. then she said, uh, when the war ended, as you said, they had to go back. Um, they went to work and they wouldn't let him in, the women, in, because one of the guys hung himself off on the light lamp posts because mm -hmm. he didn't want to go back. Mm -hmm. Probably was a fascist or whatever. I don't know. I'm pretty deep to. Yeah. The other thing was about the, the two girls. And I, I haven't read the article in the historical magazine, and I don't know if you go into it, but I know that I, when I read about it here at the museum, I dug it a little bit. Um, the one girl ended up killing herself later on, and the other one was a closet. Uh, alcoholic and died at 47 years old pretty, and, and never told her family. Her husband, after she died, uh, they were driving back from the funeral, told his son and his daughter-in-law about her and all that. So in a sense, the two girls, uh, it, it, as you said, it, really, it, it killed them. <laughs> yeah, I have, very quote, young age. I have a quote from uh, a daughter of one. And she said, we didn't, we didn't find out until after she died, but we weren't surprised. We always knew there was some sort of skeleton in her closet. So it's a really tragic story. Uh, I think they had to do something. I don't know. I, I, I can't. I'm glad they didn't charge them with treason. But you know, as you say, their lives were completely spoiled. Yes. Um, did you have any evidence of, of uh, any soldiers at Selfridge Field? I've heard that in the rafters there is initials in German words. They think there may have been. Yeah, I've heard that too, and I've never been able to get up to there into that. Yes, there were there were some. Uh, also, what Gross Eel had a few, um, Romulus there a few. Wherever you had barracks and maybe if you could have the fencing and all the things that were needed. So, but I've never seen that. I need, you know how I can get up there and see if that's up there? Uh, I know someone who might do that. Yeah. I know uh, back in Indiana there's a Camp Atterbury in southern Indiana. They had Italian prisoners. They built a chapel and it's still there and it's just gorgeous woodwork and murals. You know. 
There's a, there's Italian uh, names at Fort Wayne that they carved yeah. into. The okay, you've actually seen the carvings, you know. There. I have one more question. Can yep. I ask you, um, when you mixed Italians and Germans in one camp, yeah. did they get along? And why, what are their uniforms when they were in here? Would that still separate them and cause some, uh, you know, some people are in charge and some are not because of what's on their uniform? How did that work? I would say there were frictions between the two. In some ways they got along, but... Uh, there was a story about, uh, there was an Italian who was the soccer coach up in the UP. He didn't play enough Germans. And uh, they put a death threat out on him, finally, because there were some Nazis. You know, there was sometimes a hard sell little core of Nazis, and they said, you start playing more Germans or we're going to kill you. So, and I think, you know, Germany in general felt betrayed by their ally, uh, Italy. So maybe some of that bad feeling was there. But they, uh, they really didn't mix them all that much. In the UP, there were just a scattering of Italians. The Italians tended to be in, in two or three camps, and they didn't really mix them all that much. So that, I don't know. I think, I'm sure there were frictions. Did I see any hand back here? Yes? I had a question about the economics. When you say the POWs like, worked on a farm, the yeah. farmer had to take care. They made, what, 80 cents a day, is that whatever it was. Yep. So did the farmers pay the soldiers, or were they reimbursed by the government for taking these, these prisoners on, or how did that work? The farmers paid the prevailing local wage to the treasury, to the U.S. Treasury. And actually, the system made money. It actually made money. So okay. it was more than self-supporting. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they had to pay for them, yes. They were, they were a resource. They paid the government, and then it was gone through that way. Yeah. Other than the obligatory Red Cross postcard back to families, I would imagine we notified families in Germany that you know we had taken their their husbands and sons prisoner. And sometimes it got there, and sometimes it didn't. Yeah, but there weren't uh, any privileges to write back home. Even oh yes, they could write. Could. They were limited. They could write, you know, one postcard and one letter with X number, 25 lines or something. They could, they could write letters back home, and some of it did get through, which is pretty amazing to me. And, you know, the Red Cross is just an amazing story to me. But this brings up the question, why did we treat them so humanely? For a number of reasons. Number one, we were a signatory to the Geneva Convention, and we, we said we would. Number two, we're America, we're supposed to be humane, democratic. Uh, number three, there was a sense that word would get back, and we dropped leaflets behind lines saying, if you surrender, we'll treat you pretty well. And then I'm sure some people surrendered. And number four, I'll, I'll, out of five, I'll forget the last one. Number four is, word got back, I think our, the idea was maybe our, our prisoners would get marginally, at least, better treatment. And... The Americans were treated better than the Russians were just, you know, starved to death. Uh, and now, what was that fifth one? <laughs> it's going to come to me. Um, oh, I remember. But I'm not going to tell you. No. <laughs> we realized pretty young, they're going to go back one day. And uh, it would be good if they had a good impression of America. And eventually, they're going to go back, especially as it's clear we're winning the war. They're going to be the people rebuilding their countries. And maybe we can show them an alternative to Nazism or fascism. And, you know, they, there were these classes in democracy that they started to teach. They didn't work too well. Uh, guys would sign up for them. And, you know, how a bill becomes a law. You know, they'd have a teacher coming into the high school teacher. And they'd be taking maps or whatever. You know, they... That's not how you learn democracy. A lot of them said, we did it, so we were gaming the system. We thought, if we sign up for the democracy class, they'll move us up in line to go home. Because, you know, they, it took, the last people didn't leave America until 1946, April. They, they were like, hey, VE Day happened a year ago. When do we get to go home? It was a very slow process. So teaching democracy classes didn't work. But... I think what did work was interactions with Americans, just ordinary, daily, decent interactions that happened by the... Another thing to point out, and with the Peach Ridge guys, for instance, it, Merlin Crafter, these guys didn't know about the Holocaust. They didn't know about the worst 
of what was going on. I mean, maybe they were taught anti-Semitism or whatever, but they were not. They they were actually shown films when the films finally started to arrive in '46, and uh, some of them dismissed them as Jewish propaganda or you know we're being propaganda. That's not real. Others were outraged, you know. So they made sure, mandatory, you have to see these films. They did finally see them, but the worst of Hitler wasn't really invisible. It was not visible to them, most of these guys. Yes? Well, talk about good, good treatment and all that. My, my father grew up in Brooklyn, New York, uh, near Fort Hamilton. He was about six, seven, eight. And he said they used to go down, and the Italians were in a, in a compound area, they'd go down and throw rocks at them. So. Yeah, right. Well, they weren't out. Yeah. <laughs> no, I got to have to go chase them away. And, you know, I have a story from a guy, these two brothers near Monroe, Michigan. Mm -hmm. They remember. We went on a Nazi hunting mission. <laughs> we went down there working in ditches, you know, clearing out ditches. We went down, we made these really nice slingshots. <laughs> they said, you dirty Nazis. <laughs> and he said, one, he said, this is for my brother who's over there fighting you guys. So... Usually it was pretty playful and good, but occasionally, yeah, there were really <coughs> some stuff going on. And these kids were not punished, by the way. The guard kind of went, maybe you should stop doing that. You know, it wasn't too big. I remember when we captured NBA in Vietnam, we had to hold them until a special helicopter came to pick them up. And the soldiers would get, a, first of all, they looked like hell. Mm -hmm. You know, starve and everything. Yeah. The soldiers would get a kick out of giving them C rations and generally treat them well. So it must be human nature. I, I like to think so, and I'm an optimist about that. And this is a wonderful story in many ways in the middle of this whole horrible war. So maybe, yeah, uh, it's easier to hate somebody in the abstract, but that, that's an interesting story to me um, that uh, people would treat them well. Yes. You mentioned uh, briefly segregation in the U.S. Army Forces. Yeah. I know that existed, but I never realized how serious that was until I took a trip to Chattanooga. Went to the National Military Cemetery there. And not only were black troops segregated in burial sections, but the black troops were buried among the German POWs who had yeah. died on this soil. Mm -hmm. you know, and and these are American citizens. That's right. right. They segregated, the Red Cross segregated blood according to the race of the donor mm -hmm. in the 40s, you know. So one positive out of this war is I think that those attitudes, whoa, we've been fighting Hitler, what are we doing here? You begin to see those changes. There was a story uh, of a black soldier in a base in Kansas where Jim Crow was. He, he, and, he and a couple of his uh, friends, three African-American soldiers, went to a diner in the nearby town. And uh, the owner came and met them and said, you know, we don't serve color here. You know, you can go to the back and we'll get... And uh, as they're turning around, they look over and they see some German officers sitting, laughing, joking, eating, and flirting with the waitress. And, uh, you know, one, this one guy, Lloyd Brown, he wrote a letter to a newspaper, which kind of, today you would say it went viral. This man is wearing an American U.S. uniform. He's turned away while these Germans are being... That's Molly Coddling, so... Yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, we're out of time. No, go ahead. <laughs> Secret's going to ask me a question. Oh, I was she, wondering about... You mentioned the ships that they brought the Oban and that were dodging the submarines. Yeah. Did there ever any loss so that the Germans potentially knew, know that there were Germans on it and were like, hey, you know, we'll let oh. them How did that work? <laughs> There were a few losses. I think maybe by 43, the U-boat attack, the threat was declining to some degree. It was the Battle of the Atlantic starting to be won by that point? But I don't think there was any German sub commander who said, but let's not shoot that one because we've got some of our cousins on that one. I don't think they were making those kinds of distinctions. But uh, it was relatively minor uh, losses. If any. You know, ships are going down all the time. <coughs> I'm sure this happened. There was supposed to be a communications through the Geneva, by the Geneva Convention, if they were transporting prisoners of war, yeah. it should be some kind of communication. Mark, was there markings too, maybe? Well, yeah, I'm sure there was something, but you know, there was supposed to be, I mean, the Japanese were notorious for not telling anybody anything. And there were lots of prisoners of war, yeah. Australian, American, That's Dutch, right. that were uh, killed. Right. It was total war, it was just, uh, 
Yeah. Kind of hard. Yeah, you can't make you these fine decisions. You only the ship for like 30 seconds and then uh... Well, while I have a captive audience, oh yes, I, have, I want to tell you about my new project and then I'll Leslie, be done. Um, did you ever in your research find anything about the prisoners of war in Canada coming across to the United States? We had one really big case. In yeah, I know about that case. Was there more than that or was that a unique situation? That was a pretty unique situation. Matt, I talk about it in the in the World War Detroit and World War II book. German spy ring in Detroit, and it was just sort of a halfway thing, um, where this guy from an, 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 a flyer, I think, a Luftwaffe guy, was being kept at a base uh, camp in Ontario. He made his way across the, down to Windsor, across the river, and he was mollycoddled for a few days before he was picked up. And so that made international news. That was bad. But that was a highly isolated and unusual case. And again, overblown. I think, it, you know, I, I don't think that these were a planned spy ring, but the, the press sometimes likes to sensationalize them. Right. But the guy who, who helped him out for a couple of days. He was, was, he was given the death penalty, was. which was only commuted by FDR at the end. That went to the top, so that was something. But I thought so, maybe it was more prominent. You don't, you don't want to be messing around with this kind of thing in wartime. Um, I just, I got this interested group here. I've already got my next book almost in the pipeline, so I'll be back here, what, in, in 18 months. Uh, I'm following the Italian campaign from the landings in Sicily, Operation Husky, to the liberation of Italy, of Rome, where I was a Fulbrighter. I know, I know 25 words of Italian, and I, I've traveled to all these sites. How is World War II remembered in Italy? It's an overlooked front, because as you know, it was bloody at Monte Cassino. Somebody mentioned Anzio. I talk all about that. My God. And finally, the prize is taken. We enter Rome, Mark Clark's Fifth Army, June 4th, 1944. Two days later, D-Day happens. All the cameras, all the reporters. So it's been lost in the shadows. I like to write about Italy. But I needed some guides, and I've chosen a fellow Hoosier, Ernie Pyle, who, raise your hand, everybody knows Ernie. My students never heard of and, and, and Ernie was like old, you know, 40, he was twice as old as the soldiers, he was this haunted guy, a beautiful writer, and a Hoosier. Uh, but I needed somebody to bounce off of him, so I chose Bill Moulton, who is the cartoonist, 22 years old, he's got his own Jeep, and he's, he's having a good time in some ways. And he did the Willie and Joe cartoons, so, uh, and went on to a long career. So, uh, for some reason, I love World War II. And we'll never, we'll be writing about books, books about that for many, many years. Thank you so much, and thank you, Chris. And uh, thank you. Give yourselves a hand. You want to give us a line score? I don't know what you Okay, all right. Probably still six to three or something. So I got both Detroit and World War II and the Prisoner of War book. The Prisoner of War book is hot off the press. It's still warm. If you like one, there's 20 bucks in the row. And please go look at the prisoner of war thing right around the corner. Ah, my son.